Fifth Street Baptist Church, where Reverend Dr. Joshua Dreyer is our pastor, and this is our Sunday School Hour with our senior adult class. My name is Vaughn Summers, and I'll be your facilitator for this session. This session is number five, entitled, Honor Marriage. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, once again, we thank you, Lord, for this session. We thank you, Lord, for such a uh, only ten commandments, four of which honors you, and six are dedicated and and uh, uh, directed to us as we relate to each other. So I pray, O oh God, that as we look at the seventh commandment and this session number five, that we, as always, will seek you and your uh, your will to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. Our session starts uh, usually with a picture and a question. Well, our question, I'll focus on that this time, is whose marriage have you always admired? Well, I read the question, uh, when I first read the question, uh, immediately uh, uh, I came to the conclusion that my father and mother-in-law came to mind immediately and how they acted toward each other. The longevity of their relationship, almost 60 years. But as I continued to ponder the question, I said to myself, I looked at my, our own situation, Gwen and I. Our own marriage stands out to me too. I remember four years after we got married, the Lord saved us. And that in itself gave us a great and exciting outlook on the future of our relationship together. At least from my perspective, I, I thought I, because I had no clue on how to, how to go about this. I knew that she was the one for me, and I wanted to, to, to try, but I had no pattern, no template to go by. I grew up in a home where I didn't have a father, and, a, and my mother was a single mother. And I had aunts and uncles, but and, uh, believe it or not, you look around to, to, to find a pattern to... to to follow. But I was so glad when we got married that the Lord saved us and gave us this great outlook on our future relationship together. Um, our marriage could be. He showed us that uh, throughout the years. We're not perfect. We made many mistakes. But that outlook that he gave us never changed in my mind, and it always came back into focus as to what marriage can be from his biblical view that he gave us. Now in our study material, Pastor Tony Evans points out that a wedding is the union of a man and a woman in a covenant relationship. Now unfortunately, our culture has been playing fast and loose with this covenant. And people are trying to to redefine marriage and what and what that commitment entails. Now many in our society no longer value the traditional biblical view of marriage as a monogamous, lifelong covenant between a man and a woman. Many applaud the re the redefining of marriage as progressive and liberating. Yet it is only within a biblical marriage that couples experience the highest joy, unity, and security. Such God-centered marriages also provide an ideal environment for raising children. So the point of this lesson, and we can find that in our uh, personal study guides, 
on page number uh, 59. The point of this lesson is physical intimacy is reserved for one man and one woman within the covenant of marriage. Physical intimacy is reserved for one man and one woman within the covenant of marriage. So let's go to the Lord before we study his word. Father, we pray to you today and we thank you and we praise you for bringing us to this and, and allowing us to be involved in the study of your word on such an uh, intimate topic that you yourself have personally uh, created, ordained, and sustained. Father, we pray too that you would keep your original intentions before us uh, in, in marriage and in, and in all other areas of life as we travel through this, this life, this life journey. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we study the, the scriptures now, we're going to divide them into three different sections. Section 1 is going to be taken from Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 from the NASB. New, New American Standard Bible, and only one verse in this section, verse 14, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, which says, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. How would you summarize our culture's view of adultery? On a scale of one to five, Rate how you believe society honors marriage today. You can discuss your ratings and, re and reasons behind them. And this situation that we're in, having to record these things and not meet in person, gives us an opportunity to be totally, and I mean totally honest with ourselves. In a group setting, we may try to be, but we're not totally honest with ourselves. This session, this way, it gives us an opportunity to be totally honest with ourselves. Uh, why I say it that way? Because God knows exactly what is going on in our lives, exactly, in detail, and we can't fool him. So we can, we can be honest with ourselves. This is a chance to be, to change, if we need to, and to praise God for bringing us uh, thus far, the way he's brought us. So, while the world's understanding about marriage has changed, God's design for marriage has never changed. He planned for marriage to be a lifelong covenant between one man and one woman who would honor their relationship with faithfulness and purity. So, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14 says, You shall not commit adultery. I want to start this section from the, uh, with scripture from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 12, which says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, not only did sin affect all men, sin affected man's environment, the whole earth, and all the creatures in it. Sin altered the human view of human marriage, and especially human sexual activity. Sex is a part of the unique marriage bonding process God designed for man and woman to become one flesh, according to Genesis 2 and 24. In God's original creation, sex was good. But after, after the fall, the nature of humanity changed, as did the nature of sex. Where there had once been a perfect understanding of sex and marriage, the perfection gave way to deviation. So by the time the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai, 
God had to clarify what was unacceptable related to sex and marriage, especially for God's covenant people. Now, different terms in the Bible relate to sexual immorality, but all forms of sexual immorality are condemned by God. Information tells us as an example, when speaking of uh, prostitution, typically related to females, found in Leviticus 19 and 29, and fornication, as in Numbers chapter 25 verse 1, where the Israelites began to prostitute themselves with the women of Moab, one Hebrew word can refer to both situations. The Hebrew word zana, zana, that's Z-A-N-A-H, zana. While there's no uh, information goes on to tell us too that uh, while there's no specific Hebrew word for homosexuality, the Old Testament does address the issue of a man who sleeps with a man as with a, wom as with a woman found in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, and condemns this type of sexual deviation, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. It says, You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Now a different word, Nahaf, that's N-A apostrophe A-F, Nahaf, refers specifically to adultery. This word in the Old Testament is used both in the literal and, and figurative sense. The figurative senses are usually found in the prophets, such as uh, the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. It says, And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacher treacherous sister, Judah, did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. Once again, in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Why should I pardon you? Your sons have forsaken me and sworn by those who are not gods. When I had fed them to the full, they committed adultery and trooped to the harlot's house. The prophet Ezekiel also writes, For they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. Thus they have committed adultery with their idols, and even caused their sons whom they bore to me to pass through the fire to them as food. Ezekiel 23 verse 37. Now this form of adultery refers to God's people, Israel, worshiping idols, being spiritually unfaithful to God's covenant. The Ten Commandments, especially the first two, the Hebrew word na'af, na apostrophe f, literally refers to marital infidelity which is forbidden by the seventh commandment. We learn that such infidelity can happen because of prostitution, fornication, homosexuality, pornography, and other sexual sins. As with the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, Exodus 20, 13, the Hebrew words meaning no, never, you shall not, the seventh commandment is the same, meaning no, never, you shall not commit adultery. It leaves no wiggle room for interpretation and no room for misunderstanding. God says no, and that means no. Now we can see the damage that adultery inflicts beyond just the married couple. Looking at the marriage relationship, adultery violates the trust that is essential for the bonding, especially emotionally and psychologically. 
that God intends to take place between a wife and a husband. Trust is essential for all good human relationships. When trust between people never develop or is destroyed, then the society suffers. This is because people cannot have a meaningful relationship with others they don't trust. It also to, pro to propagate the human race and grow healthy, godly families and communities. God commanded marriage. And since trust is essential for the marriage relationship, anything that jeopardizes trust, such as adultery, must be avoided. Now, even the people who did not have the law knew that adultery was wrong. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, he said, God's law was written on their hearts in that they showed the word of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Now we can see the gravity of this sin. Remember in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 20, verse 6, when King Abimelech of Gerar took Sarah as a wife because Abraham had said she was his sister? God kept King Abimelech from sinning against God because the king thought Sarah was Abraham's sister, not his wife. Also in Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, Joseph was tempted to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife. Joseph was innocent, but accused and sentenced. Joseph told Potiphar's wife, How then can I do this great evil and sin against God? The sin of adultery is a sin against other human beings and against God himself. The book of Proverbs offers many warnings against adultery. Proverbs chapter 5 verses 20 through 23 talks about the man who commits adultery saying he will die for, for, for lack of instruction and in the greatest of his folly he will go astray. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 32 says an individual who commits adultery lacks sense. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He, he, he who would destroy himself does it. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 33 through 35. For jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not accept any ransom, nor will he be satisfied, though you give many gifts. God's law details the seriousness of God takes with the marriage covenant and those who break it through adultery. In the Hebrew culture, the death penalty was given to a man and woman who committed adultery. We find this in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, and Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22. So now note on pages 60 of your personal study guide, page 60, of your study guides, Pastor Tony Evans talks about the chemical bond of marriage. He, he, he also uses a reference to 1 Corinthians 6 and 16, which says, Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is, is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. Now, Pastor Evans also points out from that scripture, where the Greek word kolaho, which literally means to glue together or to cement, takes place. Now, sexual intimacy releases chemicals designed to bond brain imprinting hormones, essentially, glue two individuals together. Adultery violates the trust that is essential for the bonding, especially emotionally and psychologically, 
that God intends to take place between a wife and a husband. The question comes up, what are the consequences when trust is broken in a relationship? Next we will consider the actions that led to David's temptation as we continue the study of Bible, section 2. Second Samuel, we find this section in Second Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Verse 3 is going to be divided into two sections, A and B. We're going to be looking at uh, the A section in the section 2. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 3a, reading from the NASB. Verse 1 says, Then it happened in the spring, as the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon. <coughs> Excuse me. They destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabab. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Verse 2. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. Verse 3, So David sent and inquired about the woman. I'm going to read the whole verse. And one said, Is, not, is, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, one incident in David's life of King David provides us with a perfect example of another scripture, a biblical truth found in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. I'm going to go ahead and read that too. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Verse 15. When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Now, 2 Samuel chapters 11 and chapter 12 illustrates for our learning that the scripture, James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, looks just alike. The background setting that led up to David's situation uh, as follows. The Ammonites insulted the Israelites, so God's people went to war against them, as found in 2 Samuel chapter 10. The Ammonites hired mercenary soldiers, but Israel defeated these soldiers and caused the Ammonites to retreat to Rabbah, their fortified city. During the winter months, which is the rainy season, the conflict between nations was minimal because travel was difficult and food was not as readily available. However, in the spring of the year, conditions changed and the armies would go to war. They'd go off to war. In this instance, David remained in Jerusalem. We find that the text offers no reason for David's remaining at home while his army went out to war. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2 of our text, it says, Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. What, lab what, lab what led to David's sin? Well, David...
David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. Information tells us that in many parts of the Mediterranean world, midday was a perfect time for an afternoon nap, sometimes to escape the oppressive heat or just to renew oneself after a meal. Now we learn that David's residence in Jerusalem was on one of the highest points of the city. This afforded one from his this vantage point to to look onto the roofs of the lower buildings throughout the city. From this point, one would only have to stroll back and forth to see what was going on on the tops of the surrounding buildings, and this is what David was doing. Information also tells us that the Hebrew verb for strolled around pictures someone wandering, walking back and forth without going anywhere. Now, nothing indicates that the woman was acting to entice David. Rather than averting his eyes, guarding his thoughts, and undertaking a constructive activity, David's initial glance led to an extended gaze, because he saw that the woman was very beautiful. Now, let's look at the the following the scripture of Matthew chapter 5 verse 28 this is what Jesus said but I say unto you, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart almost the same as as uh, as James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 so David sinned against God, starting with his thoughts. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3, it says, So David sent and inquired about the woman. And of course, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of, of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent someone to inquire about her. While sin is sin to God, it falls short of his perfect standard. The consequences of sinful actions is usually greater than the consequences of sinful thoughts. While David had already sinned in his heart, if he had turned away from it and sought God's forgiveness, then the impact on him, his family, and other people and the nation would have been less destructive. As was previously stated, David did not do that, but he inquired of her. He could have learned from, the, an, from an Israelite kinsman, Joseph, when he encountered a similar situation, and a situation that we too need to learn from, Genesis chapter 39, verses 7 through 12. Instead of David running from, well, let me go back up, Joseph physically ran from the situation he faced. But instead of run, David running from his situation, he moved toward it, which showed he had a desire for it. So how can we avoid the temptation to sin? And how can we guard our thoughts with faithfulness and purity. Note the exercise on page 63 of your personal study guide. Evaluate your, sex, your relationship with persons of the opposite sex. Note the two questions there. It says, is someone other than your spouse meeting an emotional need for you? And then, what practical steps can you take to protect your emotional and physical commitment to your spouse? Next, we will see David's tragic decision to violate the Seventh Commandment as we study the Bible, section number 3. We find this in 2 Samuel, chapters 11, 
it'll be starting in verse 3, the second half of verse 3, through verse 5. 3b says, And one said, Is this not David, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Verse 4 says, David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her. Verse 5, the woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. So in verse 3b, once again, and one said, Is, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? A little, a little bit about Bathsheba's background. She was the daughter of Eliam, one of David's most valiant and dependable soldiers. Those warriors, often referred to as David's mighty men, of the group known as the Thirty, you, you should read that sometime. Second Samuel chapter 23, verses 8 through 39. Now, Eliam was the son of Ahithophel, David's counselor, who later sided with Absalom in his rebellion against David. We find this in Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 12, verse 31, verse 34, and chapter 16, verse 23. Now, while Bathsheba's relationship to these men was important, David should have realized that Bathsheba was married, and marriage is ordained by God. Bathsheba was married to another one of David's faithful, loyal soldiers, also one of the thirty, Uriah the Hittite, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 39. Uriah was a descendant of Heath, one of the sons of Canaan, Genesis chapter 10, verse 15. It was this Gentile descendant of Canaan who said to David, when David sent for him in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 9 through 11, he told David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. And he didn't do it. Uriah did not do it. <coughs> Excuse me. In verse 4, David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he, lie with, he lay with her. Information tells us that the Hebrew word for no is yara. This word describes the sexual union in marriage, an intimate knowledge that seeks to know deeply and to be known and to, deep, and to be deeply known. Now, it is not used in verse 4. Instead, the Hebrew word shakab, that's S-H-A-K-A-B, shakab is used, which is bluntly translated, he slept with me. Now, while both Hebrew terms can be used in the context of sexuality, shakab does not include the sacred nature of the act. Any time shakab is used in the Old Testament for sexual relations, it refers to wrong behavior. So with this quick series of seemingly pleasurable actions, David was opening the door for a long series of events with disastrous consequences for himself, his family, and his people. In our text, verse 5, it says, the woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Note the consequences of David's sin 
on pages 65 and 66 of your personal study guides. Information tells us that there was obviously an, an interval of time between the first part of this verse and the last part. That Sheba conceived. Note that this verse doesn't even mention Bathsheba's name. She is referred to only as the woman. The focus on the story remains on David, whose lust led to action that led to the summary of this verse. When she knew for certain, Bathsheba sent word to inform the king, I'm pregnant. These are Bathsheba's only recorded words in the whole incident. Her pregnancy could not, couldn't have come from her husband because he was away at war. And when he did come back, he didn't touch her. And he made that known to David himself. Since David was ultimately responsible, with her statement, she was leaving it to him to determine what to do from this point. Now his response as a man of action set in motion a series of events which he tried to cover up sin with more sins, including the, ma the murder of Bathsheba's husband, 2 Samuel chapter 11. But the cover-up failed. God confronted King David through the prophet Nathan. Although God forgave David's sin, Nathan declared God's words. He said, Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. David, his family, and the nation would ultimately suffer, all because he did not commit to faithfulness and purity in his thoughts. He did not honor the sanctity of marriage, and did not follow God's guidelines that reserve sexual activity for a husband and wife as part of the marriage relationship. The results of David's sin we find in our personal study guide as we study the, the, the guide, 65 and 66. Well, the baby David conceived with Bathsheba died. Absalom. One of David's sons killed his brother, Amnon, after Amnon raped Tamar, Absalom's sister, and Amnon's half-sister. Absalom rebelled against his father, David, and was slain by Joab. Years later, David's son, Solomon, had his older brother, Adonijah, struck down and killed because he had tried to usurp him as king. So the questions for us what steps can we take to prevent falling into the trap of adultery? How do you respond to the belief that physical intimacy is reserved for one man and one woman in the context of marriage? I believe this study can really help us by taking a moment to evaluate our relationships with persons of the opposite sex. Note the engage exercise on page 68 of the personal study guide, questions. And I've asked this, it, it, it goes over, this is the second time we, we mentioned this, I think. Is someone other than your spouse meeting an emotional need? And what practical steps can you take to protect your emotional and physical commitments to your spouse? Which brings us to the point, it's time now for us to live this out. So how will you seek to preserve and honor marriage 
whether it is yours or the marriage of others. First, what we can do, as it says, we can examine our hearts. Now, being a senior adult does not mean you no longer deal with temptation and sin just because we're seniors. We, uh, we can have honor for our marriage and for the relationships of others, realizing that that begins in the heart and the mind. We can turn from any involvement with lust, pornography, or inappropriate feelings toward others. Next, we can examine our actions. If we are guilty of the sin of adultery, either emotionally, physically, in the past or present, we need to repent and turn our hearts away from this sin and toward obedience to Christ. If we have not committed sin in this regard, we need to praise and thank God and ask Him to guide us in a life that is continually, that continually honors marriage. And third, we need to honor. We need to seek ways to honor marriage, both our own marriages and the marriages of others. This applies to all, regardless of their marital status. And then we need to identify specific things that we can do this week to show honor to, our, to ourselves, our spouse, if we're married, and to God. Also identify ways we can honor others for their faithfulness in marriage. And point, uh, so the point of this lesson, once again, Physical intimacy is reserved for one man and one woman within the covenant of marriage. I like these live it out exercises because I feel that they are designed to help us to be doers of the word of God. So let's wrap this session up. Let's wrap it up with Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. The commandment against adultery has no age expiration date. Let me say that again. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. The commandment against adultery has no age expiration date. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity again to study your word. Now we have no excuse, no wiggle room. We understand. And we have been under the leadership and guidance, and we still request that he, we still be under this leadership, even more so now of the Holy Spirit as he leads and guides us uh, as we look for practical ways to honor marriage and to bring glory and honor to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.